Sweet. So, uh, <clears throat> for starters, we assigned homework on Wednesday. Do you guys have any questions from that homework assignment for right now? Anything give you grief from that assignment that you want to chit chat about? Anything? Please, please go. Uh, there's Nothing. something around chapter two, right? Because I don't know what chapter it's in. Chapter one and two. It's chapter one and two. It's basically just a it's a catch all from right. yes. So basically, anything in that intro to problem stack. Are you looking at the E problem you thought about? Yeah. Beth, let's, let's pull one up. So from the textbook then? Right. Oh, gotcha. Right. Put this back up then. I misheard that. <laughs> so which one, which one are you talking about? I don't have a textbook with me. Okay. I give mine away. So, oh, perfect. Got it right there. Page 50. 51. So you guys. Yeah, I got to question Fifty-one, okay, over here. Love it. Okay, like we were supposed to on two four dot plot. Two four dot plot. The height and inches of basketball players? Right. That one right there? Gotcha. Right. If we were to make and then you have that we were supposed to do our own league, um, gym and leagues and others. Anyway, I got a little confused trying to catch up from all the other we haven't seen them that often. Oh so gotcha. Kind of visual, so sure, sure, sure. Well, let's let's throw a couple. Rather than do the entire dot plot for, for number four, let's get you started on it. Let's get you started on it. So this is number four on page, I think it's page 50 it looks like. So, so they want you to make a dot plot. So remember that a dot plot is one of the histogram-y types. So by the end of the day, it's going to look like a histogram. It's going to have a, a two-dimensional look to it where you've got a horizontal with the data on it and then a vertical with the frequency counts, which is pretty much what a histogram had. What, what are the data here, number four? What are the, what are the data we're interested in in this particular, uh, in this particular example? Heights of the basketball players. So that's going to be along the horizontal. That's going to be along the horizontal. Heights. Are we in inches? I'm assuming we're in inches. I hope we are. Yeah, yeah it's inches. inches. Awesome. OK. What's the smallest height listed in that, in that block of? 72, 72, six feet. What's the largest height listed? 86. So what you're going to do along the horizontal is list from 72 to 86 in its entirety all the way across. 72, 73, and so forth. All right, there we go. And now all you do is you wander through your, your data list and you add a dot above each one as you encounter it. So Beth, what's the first one? 82. And define, 82? What's the next one? And I don't care if you go up, down, left, or right. 86. 86, next one? 76. And then you just keep on going. And that's it. Okay. And at the end of the day, you've got the whole thing filled in and you're gonna have, you're gonna have a, a, some bars taller than others. You get an idea of the shape of the distribution. That's all, that's all your dot plot is. It's the one I had you guys do in class with to think of a whole number from one to four. Okay. Same exact idea. Just put the, put the data values on the horizontal, and then the frequencies are taken care of by the height of the, by the, height of the dots above. Okay, could you get us started for the number five, too, for the spin? Sure, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So, cool dot plot. You guys, now that you see how it starts, you guys can finish that one. Not a problem. <coughs> awesome, awesome. So that's number four. Number five, let's see. Yeah, the one thing this camera sucks at is when I start getting too far from the side, Let's try this. It, it, but it fades off pretty quickly to infinity. That's the problem. As you start getting off into the edges. Let's try doing this. Let's just try swinging it sideways and just hope for the best. Yeah, it picks up everything in the corners, but it, as I start writing on the board, I'm going to write bigger to be seen. So, number five. Tell me about the data in number five, Beth. Okay, so I see, I see, I hear 15, I have 15 values to account for. Mm -hmm. And it's percentages? Yeah, they have a job growth by percentage rate. Job growth by percentage. Okay, so, for, okay, got it, got it. What's the smallest percentage they have as indicated? Uh, Methodist hospital system is one. One percent? Okay. How about the largest percentage growth? Forty. Forty. And that, so, okay, this is a perfect candidate for a STEM and LEAP and not a dot plot. 
If we were to do a dot plot for this one, why would this be annoying? It'd be one through 40. You wouldn't you? If the smallest one, tell me. Kathy, I did like one through 5% and then 5 through 10%. Totally. I was thinking even, even making it even tighter than that. I, I love this. So Kathy had a vote. We'll do it a couple different ways. We'll do it Kathy's way first. The reason why you don't want to do this in a, in a dot plot is you're going to have to write 40 values down and then put dots above the 40. And chances are, with only 15 values, they're going to be so spread out it won't be useful to you as far as, as, far, as far as what to look for. So what Cassie said was, she said, let's go in the percentages. Oh, wait a minute now, hang on a second, I'm confused. If you, if you went one through five, what were your leaves? I did like the percentages in there. I had like one through five and then I just did, like we had one person that was one percent and then like- one Oh, one I think I know what you did. I, see, I think I see what you did, one Cassie. Four, I think I see five. what you did. So you did, let me see if, I, if I'm getting this correct. I tried to do it the way we did it in class uh -huh. on the last one, because it wasn't exactly sure. Can I, let me not do it your way first. I'm gonna do it the first, as soon as, as, soon as Beth told me the numbers she told me, I had an idea. And it was to go with the percent, uh, zero, one, two, uh, three, excuse me, and then four, like this. I'm gonna do this vertically, just to, just to draw a, contra a contrast from this guy over here. So what this is gonna be, uh, in the stems, this is gonna be the, uh, the tens place. And I'm making an assumption here, Beth, tell me if I'm right. Um, all these percentages are to the nearest whole percent. There's no point anything. No. Perfect, that makes it even easier for us. So if I go zero, one, two, three, or four, these are gonna be the tens place of the percentages. And the leaves will be the ones place. So for example, Beth, I heard there was a one percent. So that would just be zero, 01, which would be 01%. Now, now it's not 0.01, it's just that 1% has nothing in the tens place. Right. So that's a one percentage point. Uh, are there any more single digit percentages? Yeah, there's yeah. four, five, two, seven, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, because the tens place of 10 is one, and then the units place. So basically, here are the tens places. These guys over here are gonna be the units place. These are gonna be the units place over here. So when you see 01, a zero in the tens place and a one in the units place is one, 1%. One zero and four, 4%. Zero and five, 5%. Zero and two, 2%. One and zero, 10%. You said 40, right, Beth? Right. So somewhere in here, there's a four zero for 40%. Are there any 20s and 30s? Yeah, two. Is it 22? Yeah. So that's going to be this this bad boy right here. There's 20. more in the... There's more in, the, in, the, in these guys here? Yeah, there's two 11s and a 12. Two 11s and a 12? There you go. And then there's a 40, and that's it. There's a 40? That's what going to be, 15. So there they are, all accounted for. So what you're doing now is you're, you're A, not doing it as a dot plot. Because the dot plot, you have 40 different horizontal values to put dots above. And because there's so little repetition, it would just be, you wouldn't get any grouping. You wouldn't get this idea of grouping that you get, you get with this. And the other nice thing about this is why I check to make sure, are they to the nearest whole percent or is it to the nearest tenth of a percent? This would be a little bit messier if it was to the tenths of a percent. Then I would just say, the hell with it, do a histogram and group things together. And I don't expect you guys to walk out of last week and this week, knowing which one of these to do each time. I don't expect that. So if, if, you, if, you're, if you're paranoid about me giving you a set of data and saying, you know, represent this in the most efficient possible way, I'm not gonna do that. I wanna give you a bunch of data and say, draw me a dot line. <laughs> draw me a set of leaf. And, and the idea of which kind to draw comes with looking at data over and over and over again. Is that, is that fair? Good. So the idea of stem and leaves they're still histogrammy. I mean, if, if you kind of look at it the right way, you can still see the histogram in there. You know, here's, here's your one bar. There's the single unit percentages. Here are the tens. Here are the twenties. There's no thirties, and there's the forty. There's your histogram. Sideways, you can make it vertical if you want to. Totally up to you. But the idea of it is that you group it in a way so that you see clustering of likes. Now, Cassie, what you said was you broke it down instead of just by single digits. She went zero to four. I'm not saying it makes more, it just makes different sense. So Kathy's saying is she could also do it a different way. So here's part B. So have two for each of the zeros, ones, twos, 
threes, fours, and fives. So they, they still, it, wait, that was too far. We don't need fives, this is fours. It's still, it's still doing the same thing as ours, except now instead of each bar being all of the ones, this one will be the zeros for the four percents. So zero, ones, twos, threes, and fours. This will be the five, six, sevens, eights, and nines. This will be the 10s, 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s, 17s, 18s, and 19s. It'll be a similar shape to that one, but you get a little bit more, if you will, refined it in the, in the horizontal. I got no problem with that. I got no problem with that. Whatsoever. And one isn't more right than the other. Just two different ways to look at the same data. You could also make a dot plot of it. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying I personally wouldn't because it'd be too much. The whole point of a dot plot is to save you time, not to create more work for yourselves. Just like I wouldn't do a stem and leaf for number four. Why wouldn't I do a stem and leaf for number four? Anybody got a reason as to why a stem and leaf wouldn't be the best choice for this guy over here, the height of the NBA players? Because they're all pretty close. So I don't think you see as much. It's too close, right? That, and this is a feel thing. What would your stem be, do you think, for the heights of these NBA players? It'd be seven, eight, nine. Oh, there's It'd be seven and eight, wouldn't it, Raphael? That's the problem. It's seven and eight, which means you have two stems. Which means you're going to have these two long bars sticking out of seven and eight. It's like, oh, okay, thanks. Like that, 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 that's, that's two clumped together. Whereas this is, if, if you will, clumped enough but not clumped too much. But making this a dot plot would be too spread out. Whereas making this a dot plot is spread out but not spread. And all this, all I'm talking about is two clumped versus not too clumped. It's all a feel thing, which is why I don't expect you to have it right now. And you don't have it right now, hopefully. We'll develop it over the course of the term. Fair? But I love Beth's question about just the mechanics of it. Right. How to set up each one. Solid? Solid. Good. Very good questions, my friend. Tell me your name. <laughs> Chelsea. Chessa. Oh, Chessa. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, with the stem and leaf, do you always lose that piece of like descriptive info? Like when we did it, it was pretty much like all of our guesses, so it would have been our names and like this, you lose the name of the business. Well, that's a very good, that's a very, very good question. So when you guys gave the Inigo Montoya soliloquies guesses as far as what the average length of word per, per, average length per word was, I lost who gave me what vote. Here, you lose which business has which percentage. Yes, you do lose that because all you're graphing is the percentages or the average length, not who generates the percentage or who generates the average length. So yeah, you do lose that. Just like you also lose in, um, in histograms, not necessarily these because you actually see the raw data, but in histograms you lose even more. You lose the exactness of each individual count. But many times when you generate histograms, and we, we haven't gotten quite to this yet, it's going to come in today and probably a little bit on Wednesday, it's not so much, you're interested more in the shape of the data than which person or which entity generates what point. You, you want to be able to say things like, oh, it's symmetric unimodal, or oh, it's skewed or oh, it's bimodal. And that doesn't matter which generates, like the first thing I thought of was, wow, that's 40 way out there. That's interesting. Why, what's up with that company? Why is that company at 40 when there were so many single digit? Well, it's Google, so there you go. Oh, it was Google. I was thinking it was a very small company. Because nope. I was thinking if you look at a very small company, suppose they have 10 people and they hire four more, well, that's 40% growth, isn't it? I mean, right, it's 40% growth. Of course, Google's not a small company and they generate. And what year was this, was this taken? Like 08, 09? I don't think it does. It doesn't say. Oh, it doesn't say. Okay. Yeah, no, it doesn't say. Say that again? It says go look for it if you want to know. Go, it says that? That'd be awesome. No, 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 I mean, it's, it's definitely 60% more, but if you add 12 to 20, but at the same time, it's like, would you classify that as huge? And then it becomes a matter of looking at the, what the context is. So, but back to the question that Chester asked, which is a very, very good one. Yes, you do lose that. But the big picture that you're getting from a histogram is usually just the shape of the data. And if the shape is a certain way, what we can do with that data, being, based being on that shape. So that's what we really care about in this case. Is it, but is that specific to a seven leaf? You're always going to lose. 
Well, it's, it's limited histograms for the most part. All these are histograms. I mean, even I, I know dot plots, you don't lose it at all because you're actually seeing each individual data point. Stem and leaves, yeah, you do lose that. But you lose which player is who in this. I mean, they, they didn't give us that in the data. But each of those numbers has a player attached to it. We've lost those people in doing it this way. So you, all, you do lose something, but it's not that important for us to know it right, right then. Is that fair? I saw a hand go up, I thought. Raphael, go! So, I guess my question is, now some teachers are really sticklers about I know. this. So, on the test, are you going to always want to see the units? For example, you want us to clearly identify the units place, percentage, tens place, like... A properly things. constructed graph speaks for itself. Okay. In other words, if I, if I give you the data, and it's sitting there on a block in front of you, and I tell you to make a stem and leaf, I'll know if you did it right, because it's going to talk to me. As much as the graph does talk to me, I mean... I don't break that much coffee. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to say, okay, obviously he knows how to break this down. If, okay. it, if, it, if, there's a, a, if there's a potential for confusion, I'll say use blood for the stem and blood for the leaves. Yeah. Like if it's data that's not entirely, I, I like to use real data that I pulled offline, but at the same time, that gets pretty messy. So if it seems confusing, I'll make sure it's clear enough for you so it's not confusing. But yeah, I'm not that much of a sticker. Okay. The, the graph, it was like about the graph speaks for itself. It really does. I like it in class. I tend to put a lot more notes on things to make sure that when you go back and look at your notes, you have a reference point. Okay. But yeah, don't worry about that. Okay. Like they'll speak for themselves. That's the best part of good graphs. A good graphical display, a good two or three dimensional display of information should tell you exactly what it needs to tell you by itself without having to worry about uh, inter too much interpretation. Cool? Yeah. Anything else give you guys grief in there? Anything else? Please take a look. Tell me your opinion. Shelby, thank you. Go ahead, my friend. I don't know if I maybe just skimmed over it, but what's inferential and descriptive in nature? It's a great question. Explain the difference, my friends, for Shelby, uh, and for everybody else for that matter, because this is pretty important. Descriptive versus inferential statistics. Pick one and define it, my friends. Pick one of those two terms and define it. Either one, either one. And tell me your name, my friend. Drew. Drew, go for it. Uh, descriptive data like measures or describes the population. I love that. Can I edit your first one a little bit? I, I, I love Drew's definition of inferential statistics was spot on. Because inferential is a random sample. You take a sample. And then the descriptive is actually data that's been collected. Good, and report it back. So the, the random sample itself, let's use, let's use Raphael's bit about the sample to kind of go with that. So you, you draw a sample. You draw a sample. Say you've sampled, I don't know, 2,500 college students to try to assess how much student loan each one has. This is apparently the new bubble, which I'm very, very nervous about. I just saw some numbers come in from around Oregon, the amount of student debt that students are carrying, and it's, it's freaking terrifying. So let's say you're, you're, you're concerned, so you randomly select 2,500 students from all over the country, and you, and you ask them how much student debt are you carrying. Okay, and you collect that. Maybe you make a bar, uh, a bar graph of some kind, whether it's a, whether it's a stem and leaf or a histogram, and you report back on that data of those 2,400 students. Is that descriptive or inferential? Descriptive. That is only descriptive, isn't it? Yeah. You collected 2,500 data points. You presented 2,500 data points. Now, solid, solid so far. Collect data. Report back data. That's it. That's it. You might put it in graphical form to make it more user friendly rather than putting 2,500 data points. That gets a little bit nasty. Perfect, perfect. That's descriptive. Awesome. How can we make that inferential? Um, let me add one thing. Suppose the average amount of debt for all of those 2,500 students, let's make a number up. Suppose the average amount of debt was $5,000. I, I thought it was low ball that. Let's just like, really? <laughs> okay. Let's say thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, like I'm 30 remembering my right. college days, friends. I, I was working sixty hours a week as a bartender and a dishwasher, and I applied for uh, was it Pell, a Pell oh, grant. Pell grant yeah. They wouldn't give me money. They said they said we can give you money if you stop working. I was like, okay, no problem. Like, how long? Well, you have to wait like six to eight months. I'm like, what the hell am I supposed to do for six to eight months while I'm waiting for that check to come in? Well. I'm like, thanks, I'll just keep washing dishes, making drinks. <laughs> so I qualified for like 200 bucks in student aid for four years, which was easy to pay off. That also didn't help me at all. I think I bought half of one book one term. Um, nonetheless, so do you think 30,000 is more, more, more yeah. realistic? Okay, average among the 2,500 students we randomly surveyed, their average student debt was $30,000. Let's make it inferential now. Let's make it inferential. Ooh, Athena. Athena, thank you. So if you, the, that's the 
people you actually polled. Yes. That is descriptive. Inferential would be to, to like it says, to infer, to apply it to America. So the what would you say about the average student in America? would have debt of $35,000. There we go. Although we didn't test everybody in America. We did not, but we drew a random sample. And assuming the random sample was drawn randomly enough, and we didn't get any goofy outlier data, more and more that to come. We can claim that the average amount of student debt should be around 30000 bucks. And I know the book doesn't harp on this too much right now, but what should be applied to that 30000 as soon as we go out to apply it to the entire population margin of students? Error. The margin of error. The margin of error. Absolutely, Cassie and Mike. The margin of error. So there should be a plus or minus on that. The only way you can't have a margin, or you shouldn't have a margin of error, is if either your A, just describing your sample, because the sample doesn't have a margin of error. Margins of error are only inferential when you're trying to make a sample stand for a population. And a margin of error is a nod. It's a nod that says there's a chance that this number in our sample is not exactly what the parameter value we want is. The margin of error makes up for some of that, un that uncertainty. So plus or minus, say, 5,000 bucks. 30,000 plus or minus 5,000. Somewhere between 25,000 and 35,000 is the actual average amount of debt that all the students have. It's somewhere in that range. We don't know exactly what it is. So we give them a range of values. It's still kind of vague, though. Like, get, taking the data, like, I understand you go out and it's a random sample, yes. but I, can, I still can't visualize it in my mind as to why it targets the middle. Why it targets that. Give me one. nine and a half weeks. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> Raphael, I have designed this course to answer <laughs> like, that question by the end. I love that. I love the fact that you can't, you don't buy that right now. Because honestly, who the hell says with millions of college students carrying debt, who the hell says the 2,500 would be a good enough sample? Would you believe four is a good enough sample? No, no. That's okay. You don't have to believe it. It can be. I want to show you by the end of the term, even with a wildly skewed distribution, a sample size of four will do a marvelous job in approximating where the actual center is of a population, even if you can't get anywhere near the actual population. I know it, 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 it's, it's counterintuitive. Because what you guys are used to is you're used to exhausting every, every question. You're used to things like censuses. Is it census or sensi? Plural of census. Sensi. That sounds funny. That's more fun to say. It's a sensi. You're used to when you actually go out and you eliminate uncertainty by asking like, every single person. It sounds like an erectile dysfunction. Like sensi. Like, yeah. I wasn't going there with it, but you know, you do whatever. <laughs> it makes sensi. <laughs> so, so, but you, you don't need... You don't need anywhere near 100% of anything as long as your sample was drawn randomly enough. And that's the big if. That's the big if. We, we deal with that a lot in 244. But I love the fact that you're not entirely sold on that, Raphael. Good for you. Good for you. It's not the kind of thing you should accept. But give me, like I said, give me like nine weeks and we'll slowly put the pieces together. And by the time you're done, you'll have it, you'll have it in hand. No problem. Cool? Check that out. We're doing fine. Anything else give you guys grief? Did we, did we answer that one enough for you? Yeah, we didn't know. Okay, wait a minute. On. Wait a minute. Shelby. Shelby, right. Shelby and Chester. Shelby. Sh yeah. no, no. I can't remember Shelby. I also can't remember Mustang. <laughs> Lack of memory. Don't add more stuff to it. <laughs> Mike. David. David. Where's Matt? I'm getting my 105 class, which is also in this class. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to associate people with teach. Most of you sat down roughly where you did on Wednesday. Thank you for that, by the way. That helps. That does help. Yes, there's no matter Mike. Okay, wrong class. Same room, wrong class. I'm off by, no I'm off by 24 hours. <laughs> Which had Lucas did on Wednesday, no one said the same. You, you cheat. Thank you. <laughs> Test me already. Good. So, if somebody was starting to say something like, we, we were not entirely sure that answer. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. No, I just had a question. Because um, on chapter 2, question 10, okay. asking about to do group frequency distribution and like okay. get into a graph, and I don't think we've gone over that, so I didn't want to. Hold that thought. Is, is, is Shelby's question answered sufficiently? We're, yeah. we're happy with that answer as far as descriptive versus inferential? Great, great question. Okay, group frequency distribution, you did. I didn't call it a group frequency distribution, it was just a frequency distribution. Okay. But it's what happens when you take raw data and then you group it into those, those bins. Like, for example, think about back to Wednesday, there was the 20 data points we had of the products made by a certain company. Mm -hmm. And then we took that raw data and fed it into a distribution where you had something to something, something to something, something to something. That's all you had to do there. Okay. So did you have, a, I'm assuming you had a bunch of raw data given to you. Yeah, it was the speeds of 55 cars. Speeds of 55 cars, and they wanted you to group it into it. So let's just let's just get that one started, okay? Yeah, 
Uh, number 11 is similar pick in stealing with annual salary. And I had trouble with that. Pick, pick either one of those just to get you, get you guys the... the is very similar. It's, sure? Yeah. Okay, so Cassie, give me the context of, your, of the problem we're talking about. And the, the number 10, is that what it was? Yeah. It was okay. 10. So this is number 10 from chapter 2. So give me the give me the context. We're we're looking at a bunch of numbers that all stand for what? Uh, it, there's the fifty third part measured was. by a radar device on a city street. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this as as algebraically as algebra -y as I can without making it to, to the point where it makes you nauseous. So I'm going to call it x. The variable we're interested in is how fast the cars are going. Uh, the cars are going. Speeds of the cars. That's going to be the the left column. And the right column is going to be how many cars fell into that group. So I'm going to call this the frequency column. You would call it the Y column back in algebra class. I have a hard time spelling today. Sorry, world. So the original block of data that comes at you has a whole bunch of numbers into it, which, as we agreed on Wednesday, is hard to look at sometimes. You've got too much to look at. It's hard for your brain to process. Did they tell you the, 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 the widths of all of the... Uh, the, these groups. So the smallest, the smallest range of values was what? What did it start at? 12 to 18. 12 to 18? Love it. So 12 to 18, and I'm guessing the next one would be 18 to 24, to 24 and then 24, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And we keep going until we get, how far do we have to go until we've got them all, friends? 54. 54? Let's just, let's just finish these off. And again, we'll get you started. No, don't need to finish the entire thing, because I think once you see the beginning, you'll be like, oh, I got that now. Then you have 42 to 48, and so forth. Oh, here we are. 54, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, the first thing you have to do is figure out how many cars are between 12 and 18. This is in miles per hour, I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, I just I'm going to make the assumption it is just because we're talking about a residential. I heard residential street. So we'll assume it's miles per hour, not things like inches per, inches per second or anything like that. So you figure out how many cars are from 12 to 18. Right. Now, the one, one thing that students often ask me, and it's a great question. What if there is a car that was going 18? Then it's going to be under the frequency between 12 and 18, right? But why not here, Raphael? Well, because you would probably go with the lower estimate, right? I, I, uh, okay. I, don't have a, I don't have one right answer for this. I've got a number of right answers. One way to deal with this is to treat it like this. Like an integral? Yes. Um, one way. This is, now, this is one way, friend. I'm not saying this is the only This is one way to deal with it. One way is to deal with it like this. And, uh, and uh, now this is this is exactly the opposite of what Raphael just said. This would say put 18 in this group. It says put everything up to but not including 18 in this group, and then stick 18 in this group. That's one way to deal with it. Another way to deal with it is to do what Raphael said. Include the smaller number, include, include the time numbers in the lower group. That's another way to deal with it. A third way would be to split the difference. Suppose you had two 18s, put one up and one down. What I would do personally, this is just my, my personal opinion, what kind of data is speed of a car? Velocity. Velocity. What kind of? Classified as qualitative or quantitative? Is it quantitative, quantitative. or quantitative? Quantitative. quantitative. I, I'm sorry. I heard a bunch of, bunch of answers. I, I couldn't quite make them out. Qualitative. Quali because it's uh, quantity. So if it's a quantity, then it's quantitative. It's is, it a is, is it a number or is it a non-number? It's a number, right? It's a number, which makes it quantitative, right? Qualitative would be like how many cars, are, or excuse me, uh, what kind of cars are going on the road? Is it more trucks? Is it more cars? Is it more, is it more vans? Is it more minivans? That's qualitative. What models, right? How many flat tires are they getting? Well, that's actually quantitative too. But qualitative would be attributes, the names of the cars, the type of vehicle. This is quantitative. And what kind of quantitative, discrete or continuous? Definitely continuous, shall we? Definitely continuous because you're measuring it. What I would do is I'd go back, and this is outside the scope of what your book allows you to do. I'd go back to the source data and say, give me one decimal place of accuracy, please. So in other words, what's the first number in that chart? The first number in that block of text? 27. 27. It's not actually 27. It's either 27.2 or 27.1 or it's 26.8 or 26.9. They've rounded it to 27. A continuous value will most likely never equal exactly 18. It'll be a little bit below or a little bit above. If it's a little bit below, it'll fall on this one. A little bit above, it'll fall up in this one. You see what I'm getting at there? Now, you can't do that here because you have the data that they gave you. So I would say pick any one of those solutions that we just discussed. 
either put the, the, the tie values in the bottom, as Raphael said, put the tie values in the top. Like I said, I guess this wouldn't be this, it would be this at that point. But you have to follow the same pattern, right? In order to be, in order to, in order to either, uh, you have to, because if you don't, you're either gonna attempt, you, you have the potential to over or under represent the center. Right. Yes, exactly, exactly. But yeah, definitely follow the same pattern. Much like in, in calculus, those of you taking calculus, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you do, <laughs> when you do integration, you try to keep the same, the same width of each of the rectangles or trapezoids that you draw, in the same reason. You'll get to the same answer eventually, but you have to go further to, towards infinity than you would like in that respect. Cool? So you guys pick, again, this is one of those gray area things that I'm not a stickler about. Plus, I would, I would give you one more decimal place of accuracy and let you deal with it that way. Continuous data, it's totally fine, friends. It's totally fine with continuous data to have that just like that. Because what you're doing is, essentially, you're creating an arbitrary dividing line in continuous data. You're saying, okay, we're going to divide it at 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, and 48. That's totally fine. And then the numbers fall into the bins created around those. But you have to know what to do with those tie values. And I'm sure there are a few tie values in there, just based by the fact that it only goes from 12 to 54. And there's, like a, there's a bunch of numbers, like 60 or 70 numbers in there. Is, is that cool? So your answer might vary depending on how you choose to kind of dial in your data. Up to you, completely up to you. Fair? Good, great question. Anything else? Give you grief. Please, Beth, go. Number 16, yeah. actually we can do this verbally, we can do this verbally. This is chapter one, number 16. The question is, or the statement is, the parameter value is fixed, but the statistic value varies. Could I revisit Shelby's question from before about descriptive versus inferential? That's okay. Not that this is descriptive or inferential. The whole point of an inferential study though is to try to figure out what a parameter equals. You always wanna know what a parameter is. You wanna know the measure in your population. But you never can. The best you can get is your sample with the proper margin of error on it. So let's go back, if you will, to that example from before. So to, so to answer 16 here, to answer number 16, let's revisit from before. So, so we have a sample of 2,500 students. We have a sample of 2,500 students. And we discover that on average, and we're going to talk more about this average bit uh, uh, today. I, 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 want, I know most of us know how to take an average, mostly because I made you do it last Wednesday and y'all did it pretty much correctly. Uh, but I want to make sure you understand why it works, what it implies, that kind of a thing. On average, they have, what do you say, it was 30,000 bucks? Is that what we said it was? Yeah. 30,000 bucks in debt. Okay. And you know what? You know what? Let's, let's do even better than that. Let's do even better. Let's say that we, since we only had 2,500, let's say it worked out being $30,152 in debt. We, we, we're going to round that off to 30,000 because it's an easier number to kind of pronounce. But let's say that sample came back 30,000 Now let's suppose we, we, we re-randomize the sample. We roll the die 2,500 more times and go sample uh, uh, 2,500 more students. So this was sample number one. How about sample number two? 2,500 students again, okay? And they're gonna have an average of that sample. What's it gonna be this time, do you think? Knowing that, there, that there's no right or wrong answer for this. 18, About 18,000 bucks, love it. How about sample number three? 2,500 students again, what do you think as far as, a, as far as an average debt value? 37. 37. Can I even go a little bit more ridiculous and call it 37,218? Yes. Just to throw some, some, like some, some, <laughs> some ridiculous precision that could be gotten with 2,500 numbers. Yeah. It's very easy to get there. And sample number four, see, so I think you're starting to see at least part of the answer to Beth's question. At least part of the answer to Beth's question is every time you draw 2,500 more students. Now, some of these might be the same ones that were in this sample. It's possible, wouldn't it? It's possible that a student might be in more than one of these, assuming that you're reusing random numbers, assuming that. So each of these averages is going to fluctuate most likely, depending on what sample you draw, which answers number, number two, which was explain why the statistic varies, I believe, Beth. Was that the second part? Right, why the parameter fix and the statistic varies. 
the statistic varies because it, it depends. The, the sample is a subset of the entire population. Depending on the subset you get, for example, in this one right here, maybe you grab the student that's carrying $120,000 of debt, which is going to drive the sample average up. But maybe in this sample, you didn't get any students with large amounts of debt, which would drive the sample average down. Now, that answers why the samples can vary. Why does the parameter stay the same? Because you're measuring the same thing. But on whom? I love that, Mike. Same but on whom? Same. The entire population. Tammy, I can do it four letters. I can do it four letters. Tammy, you're measuring the exact same thing, Big Mike. Of course, you're, aver you're doing the average. But you're averaging the entire population. Well, that has to be fixed. Assuming your population itself isn't changing. That's a big assumption. But at this point in time, you have defined what all students carrying debt are. It's a finite population, large but finite. And if you add up all of those debt amounts and divide by how many of those students there are, that is the parametric average. That is the average debt carried by all college students. So why not just go do that? Can you say what you just said? Sure. Just I'll try to say it as close as I can to the original value, the, uh, the original statement. If you line up. All of these, once you've defined what students carrying debt are, okay. and assuming it's not changing as we're measuring it, because that, that is a part of the problem too, is populations can switch. You've got every single student in this set of students carrying debt. You add up every single amount of, of, of dollar amount they own, and then divide by how many there are. That is the parametric average amount of debt. That is the true, if you will, the true amount of of college loan debt held by a student on average. Why not just go do that? Because then we don't have to worry about margins of error and uncertainty. Why not just, why not just go ask them all? Hard. Because it's impossible. I'm going to go past hard. It's impossible. How many hundreds of thousands of students are there if not millions of students are carrying debt? And as you're collecting data, kid, kids are getting debt. And that is the problem. Debt. That's the problem, too. The time it takes to do such a, to such a thing, at, you can guarantee the population is changing as we're collecting that data. And as you're going through school, you accumulate debt. It's not like you take it all down at sure. one time. It takes time. To Absolutely. Go to 30, but if we want a snapshot, as we often do, Raphael, we often want a snapshot to compare to what it was, say, two years ago and to predict what it might be in two or three more years. That's kind of where this whole debt bubble concern is, go, is, 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 is heading right now. Absolutely, my friend, absolutely. So that, that, that's why parameters don't move. Once you've established your population, it has an average. You just don't know what it is. So you draw your sample, and you put on your sample average a margin of error. More on that today, too. You put a margin of error on that. and. 95% with 95% confidence, which those of you taking 244 will build quite a bit. The parameter value, although you don't know exactly where it is, is going to be between the low and high ends of that interval, which is called a confidence interval. And we'll more on that in this class too. Like I said, in the next nine weeks, we'll, we'll draw all this together. It, Bev, does that make sense? Yeah. It's a fantastic question. Sample statistics, sample statistics have to change because the samples themselves are changing. It all depends on the characteristic of the ones you draw. So they have to change by definition of the fact that they're all going to be different, and it depends on which ones you get. That's called sampling error, and that's okay. That's why we have margins of error to kind of alleviate sampling error. Yeah? yeah? Good stuff. New way of thinking, right? Totally new way of thinking. How much math did we do today? Like none. <laughs> I think we counted a couple things. <laughs> this is the least amount of math you will ever do in a math course. It's also the most amount of thinking you'll ever do in a math course. It, it, it's way less, I'm not trying to trivialize other math courses. You did different kinds of thinking then. It was basically learning procedures, learning processes, figuring out which thing to do to an equation. Here it's all about, okay, what's the least biased way of presenting this information? What's the most logical conclusion I can make from this? What uncertainty do I have to? I mean, it, it's, it's really quite interesting stuff. But you got that glazed look. So let's take five, yes? Let's take five. Wander around. Let me turn this off. It's pointing at me. Hello. Okay, good. We're blinking. Are we visible? Maybe. Let me kick this back a smidge. That? Mm. Well, now, hang on. Hang on. A quarter of them, they save you money. Hang on, hang on, hang on. 
So what I want you guys to do, check this out. While I prep the next little data collection, I'm gonna give some folks some lollipops. Don't consume them yet. I want you to have them. I want you to have them. I want you to eat them. But just not just yet. No matter where I shop, Bob. You're 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 number ten. No pops, but number ten. That's pretty nice. Okay, so. Interpret. Explain. This is a commercial I saw on television years ago. I did a little Googling and background checking and I discovered it wasn't the first time they had run the ad. They ran it apparently in 06 and also 08. I haven't seen it since, but this was roughly commensurate with the time my son was born, which means I don't watch any television anymore. I chase him around all the time. So maybe this commercial is still being run, I'm not sure. Similar. similar commercials, Big Mike. And notice the dollar amount changes. Uh, back in 07, it was 3100 bucks a year. This was 06, it was 2,500. This, I believe, was 08, it was 2,800. So the, the money's changing as we which is interesting. I mean, they think the money changes, maybe they're actually updating their data. But, but what does it mean? It means that it's at the expense of their employees. Bunch of oh, wait, but how does that go with that? I've never heard this before. Yeah, yeah, it's at the expense of their employees. So tell me how that translates. So, so what they do is they make sure that their employees cannot qualify for benefits by specifically making sure that and they implore them to go to the state and make sure that they go get government assistance instead of actually getting it from Walmart. Okay, so you're that's depressing the hell out here right now. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. You're depressing the hell out here right now. I was, I was actually <laughs> going to speak to one thing I do know about them. And which a lot is of them are actually on um, assistance, government assistance. About 75% of their down. employees are on government assistance. <sighs> so. It's a ruin of my day, buddy. That's why I don't go. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Then that's, I, I didn't mean to cause the holy yeah. war. I, I, no. I, I, I honestly didn't, man. I did. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to piss you off with this no, no, example. No, no, no. no, no. no it's hey, man, I'm pissed off too. Have no choice, but you have to shop at Walmart because. But here's the thing. Not to derail your argument, which I think is, is eloquent, yeah. beautiful. But it doesn't matter where they shop according to Walmart. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the kicker here. You don't even have to shop at Walmart to save money. To save twenty three hundred thirty one hundred. Tell do me what you need to get, my friend. Tabby, Tabby, Tabby. Oh, Tabitha, Tabby, Tabby. Yeah, go, go for it. <laughs> it's because Walmart is like lowering the cost of all their products, so other so stores will have to. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I had to have an economist explain this to me. But Raphael, this is what I was saying. I was going for a different, a different route because of just their sheer size and their massiveness. They're able, it's like, it's the same way Costco works on a much grander scale. Costco, you buy 10 pounds of granola at Costco. That's cheap one time. That's cheaper than buying one pound of granola 10 times for lots of reasons. Packaging, just the effort of making a one pound box versus a 10 pound box. The shipping, you know, you're talking at most one shipment versus at, at least two shipments, shipping individual boxes perhaps. So, so. There's many, many little mathematical reasons like that that explain why Walmart can drive prices down and then the other, the other businesses around the same area have to also match that. So that's, I think, where the no matter where they shop part comes in as far as that goes. They can take credit because they're lowering prices so much. Other, other companies have to either play or, or die trying or die not trying, I guess. It's, that's what I was going for. I hadn't thought about the other one there too. Yeah. And, and they're, they're opening more stores and they're doing it with less employees. So that's how they do it as well. Okay, interesting. More, yeah. more revenue, fewer costs, right. fewer people, more profits, or they just keep lowering the prices down just below the profit margin, which brings the which brings savings to Okay, right. okay, good, very good. And well, I hadn't I and I didn't stumble upon that. I did notice Global Insight was sourced. So I went online, of course. And I checked out. I checked out the source of, of this, and, and it's wordy. It's it's 50 pages long, but I, I took a look, and what I, most of it, most of what was in here, I kind of knew already. Sophisticated logistics, total factor productivity, lowering overall cost structure. Walmart in turn passes along to its consumers the savings, more efficient processes. Its lower prices have pressured its competitors to adopt it. Okay, so this is kind of what my economist friend explained to me. Like, okay, I got that, got that, but I kept reading. I kept reading, and assuming I'm understanding this correctly, the, the whole point of this report 
was to see if Walmart's presence had the impact. So what I noticed, and this is what I, I highlight this, I found this interesting. The CPI, which is what they're using as a marker for savings, they're checking changes in CPI, consumer price index. Three broad categories, durable goods, non-durable goods, services. This is what Walmart sells. Durable goods being things like, uh, um, uh, like a grill. Something, something's gonna last. A non-durable good, I'm assuming, is things like produce or clothing that wears out. I'm assuming, I, I could be wrong about that. Right, right. Did, right yeah, right. You're gonna, need, you're, gonna need, you're gonna use, you're gonna need more of it, non-durable. So, and then services are, have nothing to do with Walmart because they don't sell it, but they still have to factor that into their costs. Electricity, rent, salaries, benefits, things like that, things like that, okay? So, and as I read that, I'm like, oh, well, all Walmart can only have two of those that they can claim credit for, and the report said as much. If Walmart has an impact, it will be on the first two categories. Everything else is out of their control. It's market-driven. Now, granted, Walmart's a huge part of that market, so they might in turn control part of that market, but the claim that Walmart is controlling the market is a little, even as big as they are, is a little bit ridiculous. We're talking about a worldwide market, not just like a regional market. Okay, so this was one of the first, I'm gonna cut this back a little bit so you can see it better. This is one of the first illustrations from the, uh, from the, um, the report. It's CPI, it's CPI broken down by in, in a 20 region, 20 metro region areas and so forth, from 85 to 06, annual rate of growth of the CPI. Now notice each CPI bar is made up of two components. One is services, one is commodities. Commodities being those goods, durable, non-durable. Services being the things Walmart has no control over. Please notice, CPI is predominantly made up of services, not commodities. Remember, services, Walmart doesn't control. Cost of electricity, cost of rent, things like that. They don't control that. They have to pay into them, and they have to pay out from them, which makes it part of their pricing scheme. But they have no control over that. That's market-driven, not Walmart-driven. This is Walmart-driven, this right here. But in each of those bars, you're talking about you know, a, one, a one to four, 25% or, or less or slightly more, depending on, but right about 25%. Keep that in the back of your mind, okay, friends? I also stumbled upon this little graph here, which I thought was adorable. This is, we haven't talked about this yet, but well, we have it, we have it, we have it, we have it. I mentioned something uh, on the first day of class that um, ice cream is highly correlated with crime rate. Okay. Ice cream sales, right. highly correlated with crime rate. And the point being is that as ice cream sales go up, crime rates go up. Therefore, if we stop selling ice cream, we solve the crime problem. And you all laughed, because, oh, 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 Sean, you're so silly and horrible. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. And it was. It's a ridiculous example. Well, Walmart's trying the same thing right here. They've plotted, they've plotted the change in CPI on the horizontal, and they've plotted square footage per capita on the vertical axis. <laughs> so each of these points you see right here is a CPI paired with a metro area as far as how much square footage is it. So there's San Diego, spelled incorrectly, which is always a good indicator that the report you're reading is, is top-notch. So you've got, <laughs> you've got a CPI of 3.5 <laughs> tied to an average square foot of about uh, 1% change in, in square footage. Anchorage is over here, uh, Boston over there, all right? So every one of those dots is one of those metro areas from the, from the previous chart with their CPI per square footage. Now, I couldn't take the line out because the line was part of their graphic, but what they're trying to imply with that line is as Walmart square footage change goes down, the CPI goes up. In other words, they're trying to give you what you, what you see here is a correlation. CPI is correlated to square footage change. That's what this graph is showing you. What do you mean square footage change? That's what it says, change in Walmart square footage. I'm assuming in San Diego from 85 to 86, they increased by 2% their square footage presence in that, in that metro region. I'm assuming that's what they mean. I, I, it's been a while since I read this. So what they're claiming is something they built is correlated with change in CPI. What the unfortunate implication is, that's exactly what's being said. What the unfortunate implication is, is that the change in square footage is causing the change in CPI. Not correlated with, but is causing. Think back to the ice cream crime rates, okay? So it's not indirect, it's a direct. They're implying, by putting this graph in there with that line, you are implying an XY relationship. X causes Y, or Y causes X. That's not what this scatter plot tells me. It tells me that there are a bunch of other variables that are not being accounted for on this. 
and they just happened to find this one. And as if to reinforce my doubt, I read this paragraph towards the bottom, and then I stopped reading. I didn't even read the back 30 pages at all. Once differences in consumer service prices, i.e. rents, electric, all that stuff, we are able to explain nearly 90% of the variation in consumer price inflation by considering the variation in unemployment rate changes, high wage industry employment share, and electricity price growth. Not one of those things Walmart has control over. But yet, the variation in the CPI, 90% of it is being explained by things they have no control over. So somehow, this report became Walmart saves you 2300 bucks no matter where they shop. What they should have just done was take the Walmart brand off and said, guess what? You saved 2300 bucks this year no matter where you shop. Because 90% of it's being explained by non-Walmart factors. You see what I'm getting at, friends? That took a lot of digging and dinking, didn't it? It, it wasn't worthwhile. Hell yeah, it's what Chris's point. Yeah, it took me a lot of digging. To, but how many Americans are going to take the time to dig that out and explain it to people? <laughs> no, they're going to be like, oh my God, I gotta go shop at Walmart now. I got to go shop at Walmart now. Even though the commercial doesn't say to go shop at Walmart, the implication is that you should because it's a Walmart commercial with snowy houses. It's cute. It's cute and completely baseless. And completely baseless. Isn't that amazing? But I didn't come here to tell you that. I didn't come here. Where are you at home? I didn't come here to tell you that. <laughs> what I came here to ask you was, what the hell is the average American family? That was what caught me off the first part. Once I got digging, I was like, holy crap, this is very interesting. But what I really want to know is what the average American family is. They would have to first define what their idea of what the average American family is. Totally. Was. Totally. And then do that. It could be four people. Somewhere, seven, yes. And I'm sure two. somewhere in the back 30 pages of that report, Raphael, I guarantee it's, it's broken down somewhere in there. I just got nauseated by the time I got to page 20. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is nothing in here is supporting their claims, so I'm going to stop reading. But, but, what is, what does it even mean to have the average American family? What does that mean? How would you define the average? How would you define an average for that matter? I asked you guys to give the average length of words in that Inigo Montoya soliloquy. Right? Well, it should be like num numbers of married households with children. Okay, so married households with children. Okay. Uh, Maybe. Non married with children, though, too. I mean, okay. Okay, that's not sure, sure. okay, good. Yeah. And what Chris is getting into right now, this is fantastic. I love this. I love this, you guys. This is, the, this is the trickiness of defining something like that. As soon as you try to define something, you limit it. It could it's, be income based as well. It could be income based. Marriage. It could be something like FTE-based. Very often when, when uh, COCC makes decisions based on large amounts of money, it's based on FTE, full-time equivalency. How many of you guys take at least 12 credits? At least 12 credits, right? Those of you that don't, we're going to pair you guys up to create one full-time equivalent student. So here's a student that takes nine. Here's a student that takes three. Together, that's one FTE. That's the same as one student taking 12 credits. Now, that has, that has limitations, right? If you're talking about parking, for example, it's kind of hard to treat... 12 people each taking an HHP class as one, as one student because you've got 12 people off the share a parking spot, essentially, in that respect. So you have to look at the extremes in that case. But what I really want to focus on is this word average today. At least start today. We'll probably continue into, into Wednesday. And that's why I want to move into our next little topic of discussion, which Walmart so happily uh, bridged the gap for us. Measures of center. I'm going to put center in quotes, because why not? <laughs> we, we love the word average. We love the word percent. We love these things. We are surrounded by them on any given day in our lives. Measures, centers, percents, averages. But I want to make sure we fully understand. We fully understand these measures. Now, there are a slew of such measures. One of them, one of them is called an average. Now, I want to take a step back now that I've written that down. We're going to come back to this. When we talk about measures of center, what we want to do, you guys have just gotten extraordinarily good over the past 45 minutes to an hour of taking a bunch of data and representing it in very fair ways. Dot plots, stimulis, histograms, distributions, raw data. Awesome. I'm not saying that we're super comfortable knowing which way to do just yet, but we'll get there. We'll get there as we go through the course together, I promise. But what measures of center try to do is to distill these try to distill a data set down into a representative, repre 
representative value. So in other words, we want to take an entire chunk of numbers and break it down to just one value that stands for the entire chunk of numbers. So what we did it earlier today. On average, these 2,500 students have $30,000 of debt. That doesn't talk about the student who has zero or the student that has 225,000. On average, they have 30,000. So we want to get a representative central value, representative value. That's the point. That's the point of, I apologize for my handwriting. Sometimes it isn't the clearest. That's value. Sorry, people at home. V-A-L-U with a new lap for sauciness. There we go. So representative value. And I'm not saying this is by and of itself a good thing. We have to add something called variation onto this too, which we'll get to hopefully on Wednesday. But an average is the most commonly used of the ones I want to talk about. There are a dozen at least of these out there, out and about. But an average is the first. So yes, those who have lollipops, I need you guys to come up to the front. Come up to the front with your lollipops. I need you to stand, and you if you're Raphael, even though you didn't get any. Come up to the front. Yes, come up to the front. Yes, indeed. Let's try. Very nice. <laughs> it made me exceptionally happy. So just this, we can see our, our 10 volunteers. That You guys cool with being filmed? Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> Lovely people. Yes. You have to give up your lollipop otherwise. Five, six. I must have miscounted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. I need ten people. I had originally headed out to nine. If you don't mind, it makes the math easier if you don't mind. Chessa. Chessa and wait, Shelby. This is good. It, just because it makes the math easier. And you'll see, and, and don't worry, I'm going to get sugar by the end of the day. So, so let's see if you see everybody. Yes, I see. It's great. It looks like a freaking uh, lineup. It's wonderful. Excellent. So here's what I want. Go ahead and hold up what you hold up your, your bouquet of all the pops that you have. I'm supposed to have ten. What I, you're supposed to have none. Okay. <laughs> but hold them up anyway, so you can okay. see the none. Zero. You can play the home game, you see. <laughs> you have zero FBL. So what I want what I what I'd like to ask is, on average, how many lollipops do those good folks have in the front of the room? And to make it more interesting, you're not allowed to do the average like you've been doing it for years. In other, sorry, Peter. In other words, you're not allowed to add up all the lollipops and divide by 10. Yet, I do want to default back to that formula, but by the time you're done this experiment, I want you to know why the formula works. So you guys, I need you to figure out, and you guys, you guys in the seats can help them out, Figure out, on average, how many lollipops each person up there has. Remember, Raphael has none. Raphael has none. Tammy's got looks like four. Chris has four over there. So maybe, you know what might be easier, especially now that I'm looking at the, through the screen? I'm going to make a dot plot over here of the number of pops per person. That might make it easier for you guys in the seats to see. And you, maybe you guys up here, too. Um, so Raphael, you have none. Who has the most? How many do you have? Tell me your name again. Jessica. Jessica, thank you. How many do you have? Nine. Nine. Okay, zero through nine. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so Raphael has none. How many have one? Exactly one. We got Eric, Lucas, Corey, Lucas. We have four and Drew. So we got four ones. I know, thrilling. How about two? Two. Anybody have two? No twos. Threes? Threes, we got one three with Mike. I think that's Mike. Yes. Uh, fours, we have fours. We have Tammy and Chris. No. Yeah. Two fours. I, I'm saying four, five and going four. Five. Who's that one? Kristen. Kristen, thank you. One five. Sixes. No six. Seven. Eight. And we've got a nine. We just get down there at the end. Okay, so there's our number six in terms of this right. One, two, three, four, five, and five is ten. Beautiful. There's our distribution of lollipops. Wait, I don't care who has what. But on average, how many do they have? 2.5. 2.5! Tell me why, tell me why, tell me who and tell me why. Cassie, is that you? Yeah. Tell me why 2.5. Um, just because there's 10 of them and a significant portion of them have one or none. Oh, I love that. So Cassie's looking at the 10 people standing in front of us. And then she's looking over there at the graph. And she says, well, look, 50% of the data points are one or lower. So why'd you go with 2.5 and not 2? Just out of curiosity. We talked about oh, it. Oh, you guys talked about it. She so three so and I guess two, walk and through the, the discussion, if you would. She, had, or she gets three, I guess two, and then we didn't realize that she down there had nine. Oh. So that's when I jumped up to 2.5. Oh, 
Oh, okay, so you, and then you, you forced, wait a minute, wait a minute. I went back to three. She's got, they've so we got three, three. we got a vote for three, we got a vote for 2.5. Did you see the logic on that one? We looked at the, at the lower half of the data. How about looking at the higher half of the data? I mean, I'm looking at three, four, five, and then an outlier at nine. She's hoarding. She's hoarding? Well, actually, I hoarded. Jeff, you don't think that person owns me. That was all me. I, I own that one. I did. So, so, wait a minute. So what I'm hearing is, we're feeling bad for Raphael because he has none. We're pissed at Jessica because she has nine. This sounds just like America. This sounds just like America. Yeah, it is. So, so what is a possible solution to make... Taxes. Say that again. Taxes. Socialism. Actually, actually... Make the one thing out of nine. Wait, Chris, go with that. Go with that. Socialism? Go with socialism on this. Because believe it or not, the average is socialism at work. Yeah. It, it's mathematical socialism. Yeah, yeah. Go with it. Take the average and... Well, you know what the average is. You're trying to figure out what the average is. Okay. But how can you use the idea of like mathematical socialism to get at it? What are you looking at Jessica for? She's got a share. share. She's, She's got too many. She's got a share. Jessica, if you would. She's got nine. I don't know what to wrap me up. Let me give us something to wrap me up. Wow. She should share. Remember that word. Remember that word. She should share. Okay. We feel better? We feel better? Yeah, All right. Now, maybe, well, how about Eric? Eric's got one. Eric's got one over there. But, oh, just look at Jessica. Look at Jessica. Can't be so sweet. You only have one? No, wait a minute. Keep it going. Well. Go. Keep it going. Keep, keep sharing yeah. until. Okay. Okay. Keep sharing <laughs> until. Oh, <laughs> Sarah says keep sharing until you all have the same amount. I got keep three. Keep sharing I got three. until. Okay. I need to hurry. It's hurry. It's hurry. Okay. Keep. Make sure you tell the one that that that, that Cody's Does anyone have four? No. no that's four. All right. Everybody's. I think Cody. Yeah, Cody's only got, got two. Somebody's got, 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 got four. I'm saying we give. Who's got four? No. No. no, no I thought somebody's got four. Cody. No. Threes and then one, two. Yeah, he's the only guy with two. There's a lollipop floating around somewhere. There were 30 when I started. He's got one. He's got one. He's got one. <laughs> well played, sister. Well played. Touche. So, friends. That's why I come back. So, so friends, Chris Collier has solved the case. All right. Now, I know socialism is a bad rack politically, okay. but the average is exactly statistical socialism. It's a way, if there are 30 lollipops, it's a way to equitably distribute so that every member of the data set has their amount. That's exactly what an average is. You guys used a beautiful word earlier. You said share. Share. It's a way of sharing out the data so everybody has the same value. Is it fair? Arguably. It, 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 it could be yes, it could be no. It depends on standards, not really, right? it, dep it depends on the context. It depends if it's fair. But it is exactly that. My friends, you've been lovely. You've been lovely. Have a seat. Let's talk about why, let's talk about why the formula. So right? the rules. <laughs> And please share. Don't put that on. Share your with page. the rest of you. You should have said that. You should actually delete that and edit that part. <laughs> so now. Oh wait. Hey, what am I supposed to do? Anybody need more sugar? Here, head it around. Here we go. <laughs> do you see now why the formula works? Do you see now why the formula works? When you, you would have gotten the exact same answer had you added up all the lollipops once we found the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and added all the lollipops together, divide by 10, you get 3. You guys had to do it without that formula because the formula implies, basically an average, the way I like to think of it, is it's a share. It is a share. It's a way, if you will, of making sure of equitable, of, 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 of even distribution, if you will. Even distribution, distri distributed fairly. <laughs> And I'm going to put it fairly so you can be in quotes, because it depends on how you define what's fair. We mentioned maybe by capitalism, not so much. But as far as everybody getting their fair share, and defining fair might not be fair from a financial point of view, but making sure of equitability, equal distribution. No one really used the dot plot except for Cassie, but there's an interesting term I like to use. There's an interesting term that I like to use called balance. It's a great way of balancing data. It's where you would have to put the fulcrum of the scale to balance out this. So in other words, we just calculated that the average of your guy's data was right there. 
So if, if I was to create weights and place them perfectly, I've never had anyone doing this, by the way. I've, I've tried in the past with, with stones and a little piece of wood. It would balance right there at three. Now, what you guys started doing was you started moving things around. For example, Jessica gave up her nine. Where is Jessica anymore? She gave up her nine, and you gave how many to, to Raphael? I think five. You gave five, so you kept four. So nine went away and zero went away and became another four and another five. Well, so you can see what's happened there. The fulcrum's still a three, but you've lost this extreme value and that extreme value. But because this extreme value has to be countered, we have to create these guys in here. They have the exact same average. Ariana, go. Where does our, our one command that we found at the end? Oh, you would keep. That's a good point. <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't think about that. That's a damn one. I don't even know why it was looking at me. So, it would have been, so that would have been, Aaron, that's a very good point. That would have been that. Yeah. No, it wouldn't. Well, I guess it would have been. That would have been 11. So, it would have, so that basically, that would have gone up to one of these points, and one of these points would have been moved to the right one, whoever it was. So thankfully, it was only one point, and it wasn't that big. Okay, very nice. <laughs> now, what I, what I want to do is, I just told you you couldn't use this formula. The formula for average is pretty simple. You guys can use it all your lives. You add up all your data point values. And you divide by the number of data points. Okay, that's, this is the formula that you've been playing with all of your lives. And I don't want you to stop using it. I wanted you to stop using it right then. Because right then, I wanted you to understand what, what's actually going on. Has anybody ever seen an example like that before where we actually deconstruct what the average formula is doing? It's one of those things, we just use it. We learn, I learned it in second grade years and years and years ago. But I was never explained, here's why it works. Here's what's actually going on. It's actually giving you fair distributions, balance, share, shared equal values. So I want you to use it. And in particular, I'd like you to use it on the key data that we collected in class, at the end of class last time. So here, I'd like you guys to take this data down. Here are you guys, this will be a little hard to see. I'm gonna copy and paste some here. We've got one, two, how many is that? That's 32, let's grab 16. Oh, 32, 16, copy. All right, let's shrink this down a little bit. All right, friends, here's what I want you to do. Take that into your notebooks. That's the data I want to play with today. Not that last three down there. Not that last three. Whoops. That's the data I collected last time with you guys. Number of keys. Very, very, very end of the day, I asked you how many keys you're carrying with you. I, if I were you, I'd make one running list of values. It's, it's easier to deal with that way. How many keys did you have with you last time? What I want to know, if we're going to start collecting this today, for our key data, and realize that the methods we're going to be talking about today and into Wednesday apply whether we're talking about key data or debt incurred by college students, or LDL flow, or, or excuse me, circulation, uh, pre and post treatment. It doesn't matter, I mean this is, yeah, this is kind of <clears throat> silly data, but nonetheless, nonetheless, it's the, 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 the methods we'll learn for analyzing it today carry over into whatever else we need to carry over into. So make sure you get all this dropped down. Yeah, it's annoying because there's quite a few of you in here. But it's raw data, and we like raw data. We like raw data. Okay. I'll save us a little bit of frustration while you guys are copying. Whoever had 16 keys of the book law. Whoever? Yeah, that was mine. It, 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 has, it has been stated. Whoever has 16 keys, yeah, yeah. it's a lot. 11 is kind of a lot, too. <laughs> I'm going to front load some of the workforce here, friends. There we go. Kind of neat. Say that again. I think I count eight twos on the left for. Let's see. I count eight as well. Okay. Yeah, beautiful thing about Excel. I like to use Excel as much as possible, friends. Uh, when you highlight, 
when you look down here, as you select cells, it tells you how many cells you've selected. So as I drag down, see that count right there? Count six, count seven, count eight, count nine, and so forth and so on. It's actually, it's not just keeping track of how many you count or how many you're highlighting. Then if you move over, it doubles to 18 because now you've selected 18 things. Also clever, it gives you the average of what you've selected. It also tells you the sum of the values that you've selected. So pretty cool, pretty cool. Excel is a wonderful tool. Hopefully I'll convince you partially of that as we, as we go through the course. We'll use it in class a little bit, use it outside of class a little bit. Pretty sad that I use it for like 30 years. Now, we're working on that too. Yeah. Working on that too, slowly but surely. Acad Academia is a tough ship to steer. Why did, why did it take the CIS class off? Oh yeah, we talked about that. Uh, yeah, we should have a cup of coffee. We'll put that yeah. time. So, all, all I know is what? I'm stoked. I'm stoked about it, yeah, stoked about it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When my advisor told me I was. So, so, let's play a little bit. We've got these raw data. No keys, 16 keys, bunch of twos, some fives, some sevens. And we know that the definition of an average from back here is you add up all the data points and you divide by how many there are. I'm not going to make you guys do this because it's, it's, it's A, annoying, and B, you know how to add and divide. I do want to talk a little bit about some certain symbols that I like to use in the class quite a bit. There are two kinds of averages, and we've mentioned them both today. With the, with the student debt example, which is, I think, a fantastic one, the inferential versus descriptive. The inferential average, or excuse me, excuse me, the population average, the parameter population average, actually, don't worry about this right now. I'll mention it, we'll talk more about it later when it's more prevalent. It's called mu, the Greek letter mu, which is the M sound for mean, okay? A lot of times averages are also called means. And there are many, many kinds of means. The one we're gonna talk about in this class is called an arithmetic mean. And that just means you add and divide. The population mean, you're not going to know, unfortunately. unfortunately. So you're going to know the sample mean. The sample mean, the sample mean gets a special symbol in statistics. It's called X bar. X bar. X with a little line over the top. Which is super fun. It's super fun. He stands for the center, the typical value, the descriptive value of the sample set that you've drawn. So X bar. X with a line over the top. X bar. Now the way you calculate a sample mean is the same as you've calculated averages your entire lives. You add up your data and you divide by how many you've got. But we get tired of writing this over and over again in words. So we have symbols for that too. So whenever you add anything in a statistics class, which we, we add quite a bit, if you want to talk about the, 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 uh, the, uh, the process of adding, we use a capital sigma, Greek letter sigma, which is the S sound which means sum, so for summing up a bunch of stuff. Pretty cool. You might be, be tempted to put data here, some data, and that would be perfectly logical, but there's a shorthand that statisticians use, they just put an X there. An X value stands for a data point. So when you see sum of X, that means add up all the X values, the X values being the data points. The zero, the one, the one, the one, the two, the two. Add up all those X values. It used to be back in the day, we'd call that x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and so forth, down to x sub 32. But I began to realize that that's kind of an unnecessary level of detail. You're going to be adding them all up. So we can drop the subscript and just say add them all up. So that's the numerator part. And then you're going to divide by how many you've got, which is n, little n. With population values, they often call it capital N. But that seems a little bit frivolous because you don't know what capital N is. That's the whole problem is you don't, you don't know what it is. So what you see, friends, in a second, what you, oh boy, yeah, oh, it's got a, oh, uh, it's got a little governor, oh, that's nice, got a little, little anti-Sean governor. So what you see is, if you look back to the definition of what the average is, the summation of x is exactly the numerator, and that n is exactly the denominator. So it's just, it's just short, all it is is shorthand for, for that very long kind of verbal formula. And I like it because we're going to use this quite a bit in class. I've tried to strip as many formulas as I can out of this class to make it less formula-y, but this is one that's crucial enough to, for, us to, for us to tolerate. So for our key data, I got a total of 124 keys. I used Excel to add them up for us. 124 keys, and there were 32 of us reporting that day, which comes to just about four, isn't it? Was it just shy? Give me one decimal place of accuracy, I'll ratio. 
I get 3.875. See that little average down there in the bottom right? If you draw the box around the whole shebang, it actually gives you the average of the data points in there. Or we can do the division. If this feels like complete magic, what I'm doing on the board right now, don't worry. By the end of by the end of your first take-home exam, you know, this will all make sense. This will all. Make, if you've never turned Excel on, which I'm assuming some of you have, that's okay. You're looking panic. I don't want you to look panic. So basically, you could have done this with your TIs. You could have just gone one plus one plus two plus two plus two. You could. I mean, you could have done it, and I, I, I trust that you can do that. So I'm not going to make you do it. So basically, what we just discovered, what we just discovered, <laughs> was that on average. We have about 3.9 keys per student. So in other words, if I made all 32 of you stand up here and take your keys out, or not in front of you like this, what would that 3.9 represent? And I'm calling it 3.0. Let's, let's say it's exactly 3.9. It's close enough. What would that 3.9 represent? The average amount of keys for the so it, translate that back kind of to the, the, the whole lollipop example, Raphael. It, it, it's the average for sure. So what would that mean? I'll, I'll get started. Okay. That's the number of keys we would all have if we shared. We would all have to have if we shared the keys. So if we shared all 124 of those keys, we would each have to be holding 3.9 by the end of the activity to ensure that we all had the same amount. So that's what I mean. That's just one way of making a representative number. If everyone in the data set had 3.9 keys, we would still have 124 of them. Fair? Mathematically fair? Yes. Fair in a non-mathematical way. Some of you are going to say no, some of you are going to say yes, because Mike had 16. And somebody had none. 3.9 3 is nowhere near 16. It's closer to zero, but it's nowhere near 16. So then we have to get into another measure, which we'll get to on Wednesday and then next Monday, which is how to measure the variation between that average and everybody else. But for right now, that's all it means. All it means right now is if I stood all 32 of you up, you each have to have 3.9 keys to generate 124 total keys. Is that fair? I keep saying that's fair. Is that, does that make sense mathematically? That's all that means. That means we all have the exact same share of, of the 124 keys. Good. Very, very good. We'll mute this down again for a second. The other two that I want to probably just, bri yeah, just briefly mention today, we'll come back to these on, on Wednesday. The other two measures are even less mathematical than the average. One's called the median. One's called the median. And one's called the mode. Yeah. And it sounds like a bunch of you have heard these before. And that's great. And that's fantastic. It really is. There are many, many, many more. There's one called a mid-range. There's one called a harmonic mean. There's one called geometric mean. There's all kinds of other measures of center that you can use. But the other ones are so specific to such very, very limited uh, places. I don't think it's worth talking about, personally. These three are ones that are prevalent in your worlds. So let's do the mode first, because it's the least mathematical. The mode is, who remembers what the mode is? If you've seen it before, Austin, go. Good. The one that shows up the most often, the most frequently occurring. Data point. Okay? So on average, we had about 3.9 keys per student. How about on mode? How about on mode? Or, and I like to say, the modal value. I don't know, let's fire it back up again. You said there were eight twos, right, Raphael? Mm -hmm. Is it two? Mm -hmm. Two's the most, occur most frequently occurring? Yeah. Absolutely. So by raw data, yep, I see seven threes, but there's eight twos. And, and it's a Pandora's box we can open here. Some, some people will call that bimodal. They'll say, okay, so you had, right, two modes, right, they might? Yeah, absolutely. You got eight twos and seven threes. Almost half of the data set is a two or a three. So really, you should say the modes are two and three. I got no argument with that, but let, there's so much gray in this class. Let's make this as black and white as we can. There are more twos than any other data set, any other data point. Let's just call the mode two. How's that sound? That's fair? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Now, if there's plenty of gray in reality, especially when you put this stuff into a distribution, which we'll do on Wednesday. 
Then the gray opens right back up again, because you don't know how many twos versus how many threes versus how many fours. But right now, the mode is two, because that's the data point that shows up the most, is two. Is that fair? Wrong question. Is that mathematically believable? <laughs> Thank you. There's no mathematics to calculate it, other than there's actually a, there's actually a command in Excel called mode. It's like equals, I'll have you do this on your first take home exam. Equals mode, draw a box around, and it pops out two. So you'll learn how to use that in, on your first take home. If, if you haven't already learned how to do it in other, math, other uh, computer classes. The last one I want to chit chat about is the median. Is the median. The median is somewhere in complexity closer to the mode than the average. It's got a little more mathematical complexity than the, uh, than the, uh, the, mode, than the mode does. But who remembers anything about the median? Anything at all about the median? In what way? Tammy, go ahead. You line all your numbers out and then you count towards the middle. Yep. You arrange your data, either increasing the decreasing or decreasing the increase. It doesn't matter as long as it's arranged. Either high to low or low to high. Doesn't matter to me. And then, as Cassie said, find the actual geographic center. And find the center, I'm going to put center location. Find the center location. So what you're going to have is you're going to have 32, you're going to have 32 elements that you've lined up in a row, which we've essentially done right here. You've got 32 things in a row. You have to find the center location. Now the tricky part about yours is there isn't one center location. The easiest way I've found to find the, to find the median is to go and cross off the, the, the low and then the high. The low and then the next high. The low and then the next high. See what I'm doing here, friends? I'm crossing off as I go. I'm, I'm, I'm knocking out the low and the high, the next low, the next high, the next low, the next high. So essentially, if they were all in one big row, I'd be going da, 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 da. And eventually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to one of two situations. If you have an even number of data points like we do right here, there will be two things in the middle. In which case, that's what we have right here, and you're going to average those two. If you have an odd number of data points, you'll find one middle value, in which case that's the And this is in your text. You can check that out later. So we're going to keep on, keep on uh, whittling away, whittling away. Oops. No, this is silly. Yeah. These will all be whittled away. These will all be whittled away. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've gotten rid of those 15 yeah. with these 15. Okay. Yeah. And then we've got this three and that three, which means the median is three. Three. There's your median. And I love this. I love this. If you go down to geographical middle, the median so what if that number's different? is three. Say that again, Chris. What if that number's three and four? What if the, if the number's three and then four? Call three and a half. Three. Call three and a half. Just average the two of them. Say it's the location between them. Technically speaking, you have to create a 33rd location directly between the two middle ones. If it was five and ten, call it seven and a half. Just wherever the middle is between those two. Notice how they're slightly different. Mode's 2, median's 3, average is 3.9. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Mike had 16 keys. 16, there's Mike right there. Let's say Mike was packing 160 keys on Wednesday. Which measures of center would change and which measures of center would stay the same? Let me see hands on this one. Let me see hands on this one. If Mike had 160 keys, which measures of center would stay the same? Which measures of center would change? What do you think? What do you think? Tammy, go. The average would change. Why? Because you're going to have 160 added in your sum total. Yeah. This sum total of 124 is all of a sudden 144 more than it was. Well, Mike was 16. Now he's 100, 144 more keys. So that's going to go up by 144. That stays 32. That clearly has to get larger. Tammy, is the median going to change at all? Is that meaning going to change? With a vote for no? No, I'm not going to change it all the way around it. Yes, second, third, all in favor? No. It can't change. Why, Cassie? Because it's only one number changing and three are still in the middle. You make that 160. The first thing I'm going to do is chop this 160 off with that zero and it's gone. It doesn't matter how far out this gets or how far in this gets. It's still just the biggest value. It doesn't occupy a scaled space like in the well, I've erased it now, that dot plot up there where Jessica's nine is way off to one side. It doesn't matter if she's nine or one bigger than the next biggest data value. Occupies the same place as the median. How about the mode? Is that going to change at all? No. Not unless 32 of you all brought 160 keys to class, in which case we got to talk. <laughs> 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 okay. 
That'll do for today. Don't worry about trying the homework for next class. You got a couple quizzes you can work on?